German Autobahns. Highways with no speed limits. Roads where you can drive as fast as your car will go. Here, the competition to be top gun is as intense as on a racetrack. Join us now for a flat out ride as we uncover the secrets of speed on the Autobahn. There you are, in the fast lane, driving at top speed, 240 kilometers, 145 miles per hour, when suddenly a car appears in your rear view mirror, his lights flash, you move over, and in a split second he's by at 165. But this is no racetrack, it's a public highway, and what you're witnessing happens every day in Germany. The phenomenon is known as the Autobahn. In a country with the highest concentration of vehicles in all of Europe, how are the Germans able to drive at these speeds? To find out, we turn to perhaps the fastest driver in all of Germany, Hans Joachim Stuck. The son of a famed Grand Prix driver of the 1930s, Hans Stuck's spectacular sideways driving style has made him a racing legend in the homeland of the Autobahn. A champion in open wheel cars, touring cars, and prototypes, twice winning the 24 Hours of Le Mans. We met up with Hans at the Nürburgring race circuit, where he arrived precisely on time, thanks to a rather quick trip on the Autobahn. Uh, it was about a 780 kilometers drive from Kitzbühel, my home, to the Nürburgring. And in the morning at 4 o'clock, it's not many trucks and uh, obviously no traffic around Frankfurt. And I could manage it to go in 3 hours 15 minutes, which is an average speed of 187 kilometers per hour. This is only possible in Germany, believe me. <laughs> Just how fast has Hans driven on the Autobahn? I must say it was with my Porsche 959. I've done 325 kilometers, and then I tell you, it really narrows. It's kind of an experience. <laughs> Actually, uh, the Autobahn corners are designed for high speed. Any of those which have no particular speed limit can be easily done by 200 kilometers or more, and they are so smooth, you know. And everything, uh, especially when we have many three-lane motorways now, it's so fantastic to go there travel. On the Autobahn, your speed isn't regulated by the police, but by the type of car you drive. Think Mercedes driver thinks he, he, to him everything belongs on the, on the motorway. He never has to drive on the right side. And a BMW far th driver thinks he has to overtake the Mercedes. <clears throat> and then in between is the Audi drivers and the Volkswagen drivers and Porsche drivers. And they all want to be the fastest ones, so sometimes it's kind of a race track on the Autobahn. Although some sections of the Autobahn do have posted speed limits and radar traps, on the unlimited sections, you're on your own. What you can't do, however, is pass on the right, and the police have a unique way of nabbing violators. They're driving along with private-looking road cars, and they have inboard video cameras, and then they film you from, from, from the back, and they uh, afterwards get you to the police, but very, very seldom they stop you on the autobahn right away for right-hand overtaking. Here you must only overtake on the, on the left side, and uh, because obviously many people drive too much on the left side, then other people try to overtake on the right side. Just jump from two and three cars, and this is something the police is really looking for, and they make video films, and then you come home, and four weeks later, you get a, a little blue letter, and it says you have done this and that, and it has been uh, filmed, and then, uh, in some occasions, you can use, lose your license for a couple of months, you know. So some of the uh, German racing drivers have more points in traffic violation than in the championship, which is not good, obviously. On the other hand, I must not good, because the last four years I didn't receive anything. And all those points you score, not in the German championship, but, but scoring any traffic violations, you get rid of those after a certain number of years. And uh, I think in September, October this year, then I'm on zero points and can start for fresh. What is the secret of speed on the Autobahn? Concentrating, never drive over your personal ability. The slower I go with the fast car, the less I'm concentrated. 
Then you start to telephone, adjust the radio machine, talk to your co-pilot, play with the children. The higher the speed is, the more, the higher is your concentration. And this is, I think, very, very important. I have a couple of good friends. They had accidents while they were making phone calls in cars. Doing a phone call is a very, very a dangerous thing during driving because you lose concentration. So when you drive, drive. Forget about anything else you do. Surely, with traffic moving at these speeds, there must be a tremendous number of accidents. Uh, it's absolutely not right. Now, uh, concerning the uh, statistics in Germany, the Autobahn is the place where we have uh, only a minimum of accidents compared to normal country roads or even uh, in city roads, like where city limits are uh, enforced. The Autobahn is well known for a high average speed and uh, because everybody is so aware of the speed, people are higher concentrated and we have only a minimum number of accidents compared to other roads. But much of the credit must also go to the inherent stability engineered into German cars, a characteristic often described as the sneeze factor. The sneeze factor is something new to me because I always try to keep my, my, my eyes open during sneezing, but it's very difficult. Yes, but you're right. If you are in a situation that you can look down to your radio or put another disc in, and when you look back after a second or two, your car is still in the same direction. Our road cars are autobahn tested because if you achieve like going a high speed all the time you must have a high stability in the car you must have fantastic brakes you must have very precise steering very precise handling the car has to be stable for side wind and this can only be tested on a high speed autobahn but why have the germans so steadfastly resisted speed limits on their autobahns i won't like it if i buy a car for let's say 80, 90,000 dollars like a Mercedes or BMW or even Audi, I don't want to have uh, my, my maximum speed regulated. Those cars are built for much higher speed, like to 60 to 70. And when I buy this car, I want to use this speed. I think that the Germans really love their cars, but also the Americans love their cars, but in a different way. The Americans, they love their cars and they hide them back in the garage and uh, they take them out only on, on sunshine, on bright days, and they polish them and they protect the front of the cars against stones and everything. The Germans are more proud of showing the cars all the time and also showing the, the muscles of the car, like uh, putting big wheels on and then showing how, how high the corner speed is or getting an engine tuned and then show the others how to out-accelerate them. And that's a bit different to the States. Could the unlimited autobahn speeds of Germany ever work here in the United States? I think an autobahn uh, could work in the States. Because American cars get much better now. They're getting better on rolling. They're getting better on brakes. And as you see, in some states, you have already 65 speed limit. And uh, between 65 and 85, it doesn't make much of a difference, honestly. And I think that when they, when they could bring the speed limit up slowly, not you say, today you can drive 65 and from tomorrow and you can drive 85. They will step by step by 10 miles coming up with the speed limit, no problem. It's just of getting used to it, of being more aware, being more concentrated, and then it would work fine. Next, record speed runs on the Autobahn. Germany, 1938. A series of record speed runs are scheduled on the Autobahn to demonstrate the technological accomplishments of the Third Reich and celebrate the glory of being the fastest. A showdown between Germany's most powerful streamlined machines, the Auto Union Super Arrows and the Mercedes Benz. I know this section of the Autobahn from uh, Frankfurt heading to Karlsruhe where the speed limits were, where the speed records were, were set. And uh, I must say, in my opinion, an incredible thing to do. Uh, they were trying, as far as I remember, something like 700 kilometers. 700, which is really fast. It was very, very difficult to keep the, to keep the car in straight line speed. And only a little thing that was on the road, for example, in a fatal accident. January 28, 1938. The day of the record runs on the Frankfurt Autobahn. The Mercedes of Rudolf Caracciola is first and he hits 268.9 mile hour. 
the fastest a car has ever been on a public highway. Bernd Rosemeyer is next in the powerful 16-cylinder auto union. In his first run, he reaches 265. Then, on his second attempt, as he approaches 275, his car is struck by a crosswind and careens off the road. Rosemeyer is killed instantly. Recently, Hans took a chance to take a trip back in time and relive the experience of driving one of the famed Silver Arrows. It was the car that my father drove originally back in 36, and also Bernd Rosemann, and they took it out of the uh, German Museum. I had the chance to drive it on the Arbus, and I must say to me it was an incredible experience. Because now I can more, I understand more about what kind of heroes the drivers were in those days. Starting from protection of the driver, starting by driver comfort, no seat belts, no, no uh, body form feet, you know. To break the car, it was hard work, the gear shift was not very, very, very precise, and the road holding, unbelievable, you know. You just looked at the steering wheel, chip, and there was the car was over still. And at the Arrows, my, the car that I drove, my father's car, first gear was geared up to 135 miles, can you believe it? <laughs> the most difficult thing was to put the power down. Because with the horsepower they had, the 750 800 horsepower and the small tires they had, you were almost able to get throttle up to third, fourth gear. But the, the wheels were just spinning. Uh, it was a big wheel because you had no, no power steering. So and it didn't sit like, like comfortable. You had to sit very close to the wheel, the arms like this, to have the, 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 the car and everything. To do a 500 kilometer race here in these cars, boy, those guys must have been really been heroes. The Nürburgring. Some call it the ultimate autobahn, a purpose-built race track running through the forests of northern Germany. 17 miles long, over 180 turns, a circuit so demanding that modern Grand Prix drivers refuse to race here. Even nowadays, and you buy, and I think now you have to pay something like eight or nine marks. You can go around here with buses, motorcycles, everything is on the road. And then they try to run their car to the maximum. And uh, I've spent a Sunday here recently, and you hear the ambulance going six, seven times a day when motorcycle glass falling off and cars all over. So that's quite often happening. But on the other hand, I think it's good that people have the chance to try their car on a, on a closed circuit. If they would do it on an open road, they would maybe injure other people that have nothing to do with it. So here, if they injure themselves, that's their problem, you know. Next, the fastest on the Autobahn meet on the racetrack. The German Touring Car Championship. Here, the quest to be the fastest car on the Autobahn has been formalized into a championship racing series where the German manufacturers all put their reputations on the line. Just a bit more speed involved in it and a bit more door-to-door uh, -door business and mirror-to-mirror -mirror business. And it's a big difference. The Mercedes are not the best from the start on, you know. As I told you that uh, the Mercedes drivers believe with the star on the hood 
the Autobahn belongs to them privately on the race course is different. It's one weekend is Audi, one weekend is BMW, next weekend is Mercedes. So the order is a little bit more organized. The series began in the 1970s and quickly became noted for its somewhat aggressive style of competition. Today, with heavily financed factory teams from Audi, BMW and Mercedes going head-to-head, -head, the series has become even more competitive. Yeah, it is very competitive. We have, for example, uh, sometimes 15 cars in qualifying within one second. And that's a difficulty because you, with your driving ability, you are not, it's not possible to break like 20 meters later or go with five miles more speed around the corner because the cars are also equal, you know? So when anybody tries to break 20 meters later, you're going to have a door banging accident. Or when anybody tries to go 20 miles faster around the corner, he's running off into the grass or over the curbs. With the competition so close, the secrets of speed in this championship depend upon the latest computer technology. They can tell us on all the tracks we know, in Germany and in Muslim in Europe, what lap time is possible to do during practice. And uh, we have, we started this in the beginning of this year, in the meantime, we come so close that before an official practice session, up to one-tenth of a second, they can tell me the time I must be able to do. Isn't it incredible? Wow. So, if sometimes I'm three-tenths slower, engineer comes and says, Nah, Stucky, not so good on the road today. And I say, oh, don't worry, so I have to try it again. And this is kind of a very good system because it checks you out personally, you know. Sometimes you come and say, yeah, the, the car is oversteering, understeering, I'm missing three tenths, but it isn't, so you gotta go out and do it again and force yourself to do it. I think it's good. Is it possible for a driver to better the lap time so carefully calculated by the engineers and their computers? I did it once with Porsche in Fuji. I was a half a second faster than the computer, but no, but Singer, my engineer, told me. And then Singer couldn't believe it. He said, uh, it's, it's impossible, you couldn't do it. I said, yeah, I did it. So we went home went for dinner, and at about night time, one o'clock, my phone rang. It was Singer on the phone, and he said, and he said Stucky, maybe now I know what the problem is. Which gear are you taking turn number five, for example? I said, yes, fourth gear. Aha, uh -huh. I have it in third gear only. Here's the difference. One of the secrets is the popometer. Yeah, this thing in the back because this gives you the contact to the road. It tells you what the car is doing, if it's understeering, oversteering, the wheels are spinning, the brakes are locking. So this is the, the, the deepest point of your body in the car that is the closest to the ground. And it tells you actually what the car is doing and then it goes up into the head, of course. Last year's German Touring Car Championship, a new challenger enters the competition, the Audi V8 Quattro. I, when I hear from Audi Sport that we are going to compete with the Audi V8, I never ever believed we would be in the end of the championship within the first five people. Of course, you would never think that an Audi V8 could compete on a BMW four-cylinder. That's why the cars are altered by weight. So an Audi basically weighs 300 kilograms more than a BMW M3. That's because the Audi has more horsepower and has all-wheel drive system. Driving the largest, heaviest car in the series, Stuck must rely upon the Audi all-wheel drive system for his advantage. First of all, it's a very big help in traction. When the others start to go through the tires towards the end, they have spinning wheels over steering cars, and we spray, spray our load on all the four corners, <clears throat> so we can go more conservative on the tires. Especially uh, out of slow corners, we have a super traction, you always see cars coming out of the corner of slow corners with the bag and hanging out with oversteer. We don't have it because we have all-wheel drive. Throughout the season, Audi, BMW and Mercedes trade victories. With each race winner receiving not only championship points, but a special weight penalty as well. the equivalent of placing a hefty serving of bratwurst in the rear seat for the next race. To prevent 
an Audi or a Mercedes or a BMW winning every race, the winner gets 25 kilo of lead in the car, which is almost 50 pounds, maximum of 100 kilo. So this tells us we cannot win every race. The battle for the championship goes right down to the wire. The final race of the season at Hockenheim. To win the title, Stuck's Audi must finish first, while his BMW competitor, Johnny Chicano, can come in no better than fourth. The Audi team bring in reinforcements, entering three cars. In front of 80,000 fans, Stuck finishes first, with his two Audi teammates right behind. Chicano's BMW is fourth. This year, Hans Joachim Stuck and his Audi V8 Quattro are kings of the Autobahn. Next, the seduction of speed. What is it about speed that makes it so important that the Germans have steadfastly refused to place limits on the Autobahn? So seductive that race drivers are willing to risk their necks trying to reach the maximum. No, the speed is a drug, you know. Others, tell, others eat chocolate, others like Coke, others like to eat caviar, and others just like speed, if it's just, they say, it's motorcycle, speedboats, cars. It's, it's a sort of, of a drug. That's the only, the best explanation I can find. There are many other things I like to do besides racing. Be able to race a car is not only the feeling of speed, it is to be, uh, it, it, is, it is that not the car drives is me, that I drive the car. I am the one who, who tells the car what it has to do. I put it into fourth gear, fifth gear, I make it to go right, I make it to left, I make it to spin it. That's, I am the boss, you know. I decide what I want to do and sometimes the car does not what I like, then you have an accident. And the, always to come to this limit, to this sort of edge, because if you go 100% you're perfect. If you go 99.9 .9, you're not perfect, if you're 100.1 you're history maybe and that's all about.